So like all great gardening videos, this one starts off in a motor home in Florida. I wanted to take a quick second to introduce this um, video. I shot a couple videos with uh, Dr. Michael Durr in Athens, Georgia a few weeks back. The first one, the audio was a little, it wasn't great. The second one, it's perfectly fine. I hope you enjoy this video. You can see how much energy um, and enthusiasm for horticulture uh, he has and uh, a lot of the plant breeding. Uh, he has going on. We have plans to shoot several more videos uh, coming up, uh, and I think there's going to be some super interesting topics. I wanted to cover more trees on this channel, and so that's going to be part of upcoming videos uh, with Dr. Durr. So I'm excited about that. I hope you enjoy this video. His um, new hydrangea book is linked down below the video if you're interested in taking a look at that. Thanks for watching. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Mike Durr. I'm one of the uh, owners with uh, Jeff Beasley and Mark Griffith of. Uh, Premier Introductions Incorporated, we're a uh, private breeding company and uh, we've had two iterations of our company. The original was Plant Introductions Incorporated and we like the, the acronym or the uh, abbreviation PII so much we named a new edition which started January 1 of 2020. We called it Premier Introductions Incorporated. Our goal is to breed uh, great plants, uh, good plants and great plants for the uh, nursery industry and for the gardeners of the world. And our plants uh, from our first iteration have literally traveled the world. And you're looking at uh, the new company. This is the end of the year two, or wrapping up year two. We've had many good selections. We hope they're great. We have licensed them to various nurseries for testing and potential introduction into commerce. And uh, we will see what happens. Uh, we believe there's a bright future for better plants. And I'd like to say great plants. I have a saying that... Good is the enemy of great, and everybody's got something good, but do they have something great? And you're looking at uh, just a, kind of an example. I pulled this yesterday when I was working at the company. This is a hybrid uh, hydrangea. We're looking for cold hardiness. We're looking for reblooming. We're looking for disease resistance. We're looking for additional seasonal fe features in all our plants, certainly hydrangea, fall color. And uh, this is November, what did I say, 17th or 18th? November 18th, I think. Yeah. And you're looking at a relatively clean hydrangea. This is a cross between Serrata, Tough Stuff, which is one of the hardiest of the Tough Stuff series, and one that we call Iowa, which uh, came out of, uh, out, of, out of Iowa City, Iowa. It's been through minus 35 and hasn't been killed to the ground. So this is the early stages of selection. This is how we started. All these are controlled crosses. We crossed these two uh, parental types. We end up with selections out of 3,600 seedlings. You know, last uh, year, or in 2020, we made 30. This year, I'm not sure if we'll have 30 or not. But uh, we're looking for the, for the best of the best, and it takes time. We'll go through it, we'll propagate it, we'll see what it does, and uh, we'll go from there. But we'd love to get a mop head serrata type that would do well in temperatures uh, reminiscent or reflective of zone four, which would be minus 20 to minus 30, or zone five, minus 10 to minus 20. And that's that's kind of what we're aiming for. But this is a good example. This is, uh, we have one of these with great full color that flowered, another one that hasn't. We'll have to wait till 2022, till typically May when uh, these flower, to see what we got in the way of floral quality. And uh, we'll keep, uh, keep evaluating. Uh, you might be interested too from a standpoint of how this stuff all makes sense we will put a designation on on the plant and we call we call it our accession code we database everything and we continue we take photos and we take records throughout the evaluation process so at the end of uh, kind of uh, the time a plant is either ready to be pitched or taken further we have a, a great idea of its, its relative worth. Most of us, uh, my partners and I, we tested our own garden. As soon as we get enough, enough plants to actually do so, we get it out to nurseries for testing. And uh, obviously we do it here in a pot. We're thinking about the way this works, and I think some, of the, some people in the audience would be interested. We're growing for the gardeners of the world, but in a sense we're first growing for the growers of the world. And if the growers can't propagate it, and they can't grow it in a container, or whatever means that they grow it in the field, then it doesn't have a chance in commerce. This is not going to go. So we like to think that we, we have this roadmap that takes us from the first cross we make, the seeds we collect, the seeds we germinate, the seedlings in pots like this, all the way to the finished product that ends up on the, the shelf in your independent garden center or at the, the major retailers like a Home Depot or Lowe's or Walmart. Notice how clean the foliage is here, too, on these. And we're breeding, obviously, for clean foliage. We did, we did not spray these, so... There's no fungicides. 
If there's something worth stopping at, I'll stop. The frost got some of these, unfortunately. The flowers are more sad. This is a, a good example of a mop head inflorescence. And uh, I'm not sure of the parentage in this. I could look. We label every bucket, by the way. We're pretty careful on our record keeping. And we start from day one. Because uh, there's no way you're going to remember what uh, this came from if you don't have it somewhere labeled as as a parentage, etc. And when you potted it or whatever you, however you handled it. But uh, this this is good, but it's not great. And it'll never make the cut. But it gives you an idea of what we're what we're looking for. Lace caps, for example, this is a mop head as mentioned. And mop heads outsell lace caps ten to one. We'll have lace caps in here. I can show you one as. Uh, Jim and I kind of walked down through our, our current 20, 2021 crop here. But uh, for whatever reason, mop heads have the, have the pizzazz or have the wow or the, pal, the uh, wow factor that allows them to kind of be zeroed in on by customers who maybe don't know much about hydrangeas. But many of the lace caps are absolutely beautiful. They're delicate. They're elegant. And, uh, and as my wife Bonnie says, I'd rather have a lace cap than a mop head. And that uh, mop heads per predominate simply because of uh, commercial realism, which is that they sell better. That's another good point, which people don't say. Well, hydra the insects like hydrangeas, they particularly like the lace caps. These have fertile flowers. Anything that's kind of flopping, o flopping over, we pulled out. Oh, that's pretty nice, too. There's another uh, seedling selection uh, I just pulled out, and Jim's photographing, and uh, it's a little larger inflorescence. Uh, it's a fuller inflorescence. It's, again, uh, a, a lot to say a full mop head. And... Uh, all these, none of these have received any aluminum treatment. When we uh, put aluminum on them, they will turn uh, some shade of blue or blue purple. And uh, we'll probably do that, we're not probably, we'll do that and we'll cut them back. We'll uh, put aluminum on them in January and then uh, hopefully by May, we'll see the, the bluing process uh, take place. I was looking for a big enough lace cap to chat about it. I don't see much, there's one there. This uh, smaller inflorescence I have compared to the big mop head, it's called a lace cap. You can see the uh, sterile florets or sepals are positioned around the periphery of the uh, fertile flowers. Fertile flowers are in the center. And uh, you know there are lace caps certainly with bigger, bigger uh, flowers than this, but uh, just as an example, this is what you're looking at when people talk about lace caps versus hortensias or mop heads. And, um, uh, personally, I, I, I love both, and uh, the customers at Grace's stores love the mop heads uh, at least 10 times better than the lace caps. Variation, and if you take a, take a look through here, you'll see smaller leaves, bigger leaves, upright spreading, ball types, you name it. Those are all seedlings over there of uh, lower pedalum. We're still working on lower pedalum, as is everybody. I'll show you some very variation in uh, terms of foliage characteristics in a second. Oops. You want to hop in here? Yeah. What, what's amazing about the whole process of breeding is, as I alluded to before, you never know what's going to come out of a seedling population, but these are a couple of smaller growing variegated types and do they have any worth? I don't know. Do they grow fast enough to be commercial? they got to fill a three-gallon container pretty much in a single season. And you can see some of the color on the foliage here. It's white, speckled green, speckled pink, and uh, small leaves, bigger leaves, ball-shaped growth habit. But uh, will there be anything that uh, is worth putting in the market? I don't know. But uh, people do like variegated plants. A good example of that is uh, the sunshine uh, privet which is selling in the hundreds of thousands every year. And uh, I think there's, there could be something here, but uh, we'll find out. And then the rest of these are all green, uh, various sizes, both habit and foliage. Some have a, a plum purple, have a new, uh, kind of a plum purple or purplish new cast to the new growth. And uh, 
Jim's kind of doing a pan pan shot on all these, and you can you can see them. There's four different parents in here. It's pretty amazing what comes out of this. If I can pick one up here and kind of show you, there's a one with purple new growth. There's one uh, purple new growth. There's a bunch. There's a bunch of those. Yeah, watch where you're going. I don't want to. And distilliums have turned into a, a plant that nobody knew in uh, mid uh, 2000s, 2005, 6, 7, into a standard garden variety broadleaf evergreen that's pretty much covered in zone 7 to 9. Another plant that we work on that everyone knows, they know Laura Petalum, the red Laura Petalums. There's over 50 selections now. These are seedlings that you're looking at. This is a one year seedling. This is one of our seedling blocks of both distillium and Laura Petalum. We have mainly purple because we collect our seed from a purple leaf type, but we get a few greens in the bunch too. And again, we're looking for, mainly looking for habit, compact habit, foliage retention in the winter, deep purple foliage color retention too, deep, deep purple foliage, almost black purple foliage. Flowers are all gonna be anywhere from uh, pink the hot pink to a red on occasion. And we will sort those all out next year, which we've already done with some. I'll show you a few others as we walk through the collections today. But uh, it's uh, the exciting thing is every day you see something different. There's a pretty example, good example of a distillium that has the smallest leaves I've seen on any of these so far. And it's, it's what? Yeah, yeah, the dimensions it looked like a little bit like a boxwood and which has a place. And again, to date, we haven't seen insects and diseases on distillium that, that would cause anybody uh, to shy away from using them. In fact, if anything, we're going the other way. You can't grow enough of them. It's uh, been an amazing alternative. And if we get something with boxwood like this, with boxwood uh, size or shaped leaves for our part of the world, which again is zone seven to nine, that would be a, a, a good contribution, I think, to gardening. Why worry about Nematodes on boxwood, boxwood tree, tree worm on boxwood, uh, boxwood blight on boxwood. Uh, you got enough problems on uh, boxwood without adding more. You got a plant here that's little, so far totally uh, disease and insect free. Pretty good show and tell example of hydrangea uh, and hydrangea relative frost tolerance. The uh, red leaf uh, plant you're looking at is uh, hydrangea quercifolia, and it's frost tolerant down to 25. We had about 20. 28 out here, I imagine, 29 degrees. So uh, this is not affected down to around uh, the uh, low to mid 20s. And uh, the fall color on this is beautiful. This is one I found up in uh, Ohio. I call it uh, red wine because the sepals turn, they're white, and they turn red, a burgundy red, very, very pretty. And we're kind of looking at it as a potential introduction. What, what we like about this is that it's totally clean. There's no leaf spot, no cercospor. And you can take a look at uh, there's four or five plants here in a row. Jim's focusing on, and uh, they look good. The next plant in line is a macrophylla. This is one of our introductions. We got a label on it somewhere. This is twist and shout, yeah. And you can see the frost damage on this at like 28, 29 degrees. Macrophylla is uh, terrifically sensitive to cold. Once you once you get down into about 28 is a perfect spot when you start seeing uh, cold damage. In fact, there's a whole block of these in front of Jim that uh, have been brown, on the, at least on the top, and it's all due to cold, to cold temperatures. So you can't do much in the fall about it except uh, let them go dormant, let the leaves fall off, clean them up, and get ready for the, the next spring. And this uh, larger green plant here is a, is a hydrangea relative called Dichroa, D-I-C-H-R-O-A, and uh, the common name, as far as I know, is Dichroa. What's unique about this, and I will have a little video a little later on, I'll show you the fruits. Flowers are blue. The fruits will turn anywhere from a purple to a black to a almost gemstone blue color. And it is evergreen, and a, a number of people have tried to hybridize this with macrophylla, us being one, and it, we did do it. And their thinking was we were gonna have, take a lace cap hydrangea, which means we have fertile flowers in the middle, and we were actually gonna uh, put blue fruits on it, and so you ended up with lace cap flower with white or red or pink or white or blue, whatever the color may be, in the sepals. And then with the fruits, as they turn blue and they age into late summer and fall, 
they turn this beautiful uh, bluish color. And uh, we got as far as having the flowers, having the sepals, the hybrids, but we never were able to get the fruits, the fruit color, which again, we'll show you later on. So this is Dicroa, the middle is Hydrangea, Macrophylla, and the uh, beautiful red fall colored plant is Hydrangea quercifolia, or oak leaf Hydrangea, which is a terrific native, by the way, and cold hardy all the way from Boston to obviously Mobile Bay. So it has a big wide dist distribution. Got to pull some leaves away or not, but mm -hmm. this is a dicro again, Febrifugia. It's the same thing you saw before. This is an older plant, which is flowered and uh, the fruited. And you can see the color. In this case, you got some. What would you call that color? Purplish or maroon? And some are starting to go to blue. But this is the idea that we had when we were going to take a lace cap, and uh, I'll show you what I mean by popping a lace cap off here. This was the idea. This is a twist and shout, uh, which is a lace cap. You can see the sepals on the side, the sort of dried looking little appendages. And in the middle are the fertile flowers, which is a capsule. What we wanted to do, and what we hoped to do, was to take the lace cap, cross it with a dicroa, with this purplish fruit. And if you can imagine that many fruits in the middle of that lace cap, with these blue-purple uh, fruits on it going into fall. What a plant, what a plant. And uh, actually eye candy. And somebody's gonna do it. Somebody will figure out how to do it. We just never got there. We got close, close enough that we could put sepals on the flowers of the Dicroa Macrophylla hybrid, but uh, we couldn't get the fruits like you're looking at on the video. This is a new abelia. And uh, we just tentatively named it White Surprise. I won't uh, tell you the parentage on this, but uh, it's evergreen. With cold weather, it turns this uh, rich, pinky, sort of multicolored, uh, um, kaleidoscopic um, foliage uh, transition. Uh, in the summer, it's white-edged and green-centered. It stays small. It's a compact, compact growing form, which is what I really like. And it doesn't get as big as, as kaleidoscope and uh, radiance. And the color is just, I, I think this thing is uh, in a garden center. We have several nurseries interested in this. Uh, current name is White Surprise. We don't know what it'll be when it finally gets to market, but uh, I've seen uh, blocks of these or rows of these, and uh, I think the first thing that comes out of your, your mouth is, wow, wow, I didn't, you, almost uh, instant impulse, if there's such a word. I guess impulse is instant. You'd actually pick it up and uh, probably, probably run with it, so. Really, really pretty exciting. Uh, my son's done, done a little breeding, and uh, spireas are kind of up and down. People, well, I don't care, I care. But if you look at typical spirea japonica down here, it's usually defoliated or full leaf spot in August. Well, my son Matt found, uh, grew a population out of uh, little princes, and he had uh, two, one pink. The one with the red fall color is pink. The one with the yellow fall color is uh, white flowered. Smothered in flowers, I've germinated seedlings of these. I have uh, trays of seedlings right now. And uh, my thinking is, this would be a, a great disease-free spirea with uh, abundant flowers, typically June, and it flowers on new growth. So we'll continue to flower. And uh, compact habit, these are two-year-old plants, so you're looking at something that's not gonna get too big and out of, out of bounds. This is in a three-gallon container. But the fact that you have excellent, um, almost minty green spring and summer foliage, and you have the flowers. You have uh, one, the red one, obviously you can correlate the pink flower color with the red, red fall color, the, the white uh, flower color with the, uh, with the yellow fall color. And uh, I think you got a plant that uh, in mass or just in a pot or whatever. And the fact that the leaves are still here on November 18th is al almost a miracle because typically, as I said, August, September, they start going downhill. And uh, you wouldn't buy a spy. For the most part, you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy a spirea. By the way, while we're chatting, these are going to be introduced. They'll be available in 2022 by McCorkle Nursery. And uh, I've done a lot of spirea work and, and have never really introduced anything. I've thrown hundreds, maybe thousands of seedlings away. These are the two best if you're looking for just a green foliage one. These are not gold foliage, but with good flower and good foliage retention and obviously pretty, pretty attractive fall color and uh, compact habit. I think uh, these uh, answer the bell on that. 
uh, Father Gilla in an earlier video that uh, Jim and I did out of our garden, and I love Father Gilla. At one time we had about 20 selections here, and this is uh, the ones we think are the best. Some of these were wild collected by, actually Tom Rainey was involved, and uh, Rick Lewandowski, and I think a guy named Ron Miller. They collected these out of the wild in uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, maybe Georgia, Mississippi. But uh, we continue to look at them to try to find those that don't get the leaf spot, that hold their foliage into fall, and obviously fall color well. And uh, these these have been the ones that have, I would say, stayed the purest over time. And uh, there's nothing going to be released out of this yet, but uh, they look they do look good. It's hard to argue with fall color in zone eight uh, like this. I mean, that's the thing you're looking for. Adaptability, the zone eight. We know Father Gill is zone hardy to zone four or five. So you got something that goes north and south and still gives you that wonderful fall color, plus the bottle brush, white flowers in uh, April and May, honey fragrance, good summer foliage, typically blue-green summer foliage on all these, and uh, for the most part, disease and insect-free. There is a leaf spot that has kind of cropped up recently. I see it on a few of these, and we've been trying to select away from that also. So Father Gill in general, Gardenia I mentioned before, Major and the hybrid, which is called Father Gill or Intermedia. And those are all represented rep, represented here. Video we just talked about. This is uh, the white surprise, but that is uh, typically before they color up. These are potted late. You can see the white on the green. It really is an attractive. You know, you know your abelias pretty well. It's an attractive, uh, attractive plant. I think this one will sell. And I have yet to see one that, Jim. You know what they look like? Boom! A branch goes here. A branch goes there. And pretty soon you got a four foot tall plant. I get 500 questions about that on my channel, and people's like. You can cut it off faster than you can ask the question. That's true. Yeah, you just cut it. Just People are paranoid about pruning. Yeah, they are paranoid about pruning. <laughs> this is a perfect example of a seedling variation in a species. This is a Stewardia monadelpha. It's called the uh, tall Stewardia. It's, uh, I've had this in uh, our garden for forever since I've been in the South, 41 years. And uh, it's uh, the most heat tolerant. It has a beautiful cinnamon stick kind of uh, cinnamon brown exfoliating bark. Uh, flowers are about two inches across. And uh, these are seedlings. And what I learned, I didn't have a ton of seedlings. I had about eight, nine seedlings. And all of them look like the one, as you're looking at the video on the right, they're brown. And you go, mm. there's one that popped out of this seedling population as the most brilliant. I get my shadow out of the way. Reddish, reddish fall color. Now, is that going to hold uh, from year to year? These are only one-year-old seedlings, but Boy, oh boy, is that potent. And uh, if we could get a flower on that, we got what appears to be flower buds. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Typically flowers in May, June, in May, excuse me, eight, late April, May uh, of 2022. But uh, beautiful, beautiful red. And all the rest of them, if you look down the row, are just as brown as the one that you're looking at uh, next to the uh, beautiful red fall color one. So these are our 20... 2020 seedlings on the left. This is the last of the bunch. This is the one we just targeted, which we think is is really outstanding. I mean, they're all pretty good looking, but again, if I hold that, I don't have to hold it up, but you can see it's uh, almost, I'd say, blackish purple. So these, we made a, almost too many. You get to a point you make too many selections, you don't know which is the best. You can't keep them forever, but uh, I think the choices we made are pretty good. We're looking for a compactness. We're looking for growth. Uh, again, this is the original plant. So this is the end of the second year growing season and pretty good looking plant without pruning, without any any kind of a pruning at all. Spit flowers. These are out of uh, Snow Queen and uh, Red Wine, the one I showed you earlier. And we're going we're gonna to hang on to them and wait till they flower in uh, May of 2022. Yeah, Jasmine, this is from Sweet Tea, which is a, one of our doubles. It's a controlled cross. And uh, you can see the variation. We got people grabbing these left and right. I think even the PDSI has a couple of these. At least they're going to test. I'm not sure, but we got little ones or we got big ones. We got uprights. Come on down. These are two-year-old seedlings. What what we're looking for, we like that idea. You talk about your Skydenia, or not Skydenia, but your Jewel Box, not Jewel Box, what's the little one? Uh, Diamond Spire. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we're looking for upright and we're looking for compactness. And uh, I didn't think people would be that interested in Gardenia since there's a million of them out there, but uh, Gardenia is going to sell forever, I think. And these are all big doubles. Flowers average about, about two and a half to three inches. 
And uh, these were all shifted up from uh, three gallon plants. So that's the next, uh, the next thing we'll probably introduce. But uh, these are done and these have been, some of them have been accession. But uh, one thing I know a lot of people are looking for, they'd like to have these, I think, as a hedge without pruning the smithereens out of them. And you got something like that, which is already in genetically upright and has a big double flower and fragrant. It might be a good addition or a container type plant too, since it flowers. All these flower have flowered sporadically all summer long. And the other thing that we got going with these is we got the doubles sometimes do not set fruit. And uh, I see fruit set, even though that's a lousy plant. See the fruit on there? There's fruit coming, there's fruit coming. We will collect the fruits, and uh, there's a lot of fruit. What's the one, uh, Mark Griff, Mark Griff Select or whatever? It used to have a great fruit. That was a single. That was a single. Yeah, that's it one. Fruit. It had a great fruit on it. It did have great fruit on it. Yeah. It did have great fruit. So it's exciting. Look at the fruit on this, baby. There's still some finer. I don't know if you know what a fruit looks like. Or yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you do, but... Yeah. yeah, there it is. For those of you who don't know, these will turn brighter and brighter yeah, red. Yeah, orange. Yeah, orange yeah. red. Yeah. And the seeds are little white seeds that look a little bit like uh, green pepper seeds. And uh, we sow them immediately, and they come up. And this is uh, what you're looking at is just what we did in the second year crop. And uh, actually quite quite amazing what comes out of a single, single clone or single genotype. And you end up with this unbelievable... Variation are little leaf forms, big leaf forms, upright forms, spreading forms. There's more on this side. <laughs> I just, I'm amazed. This is a, this is where the real inherent problem is: is what do you keep and what do you throw away? Right. And uh, kind of a tough call sometimes. Back to the beautiful motorhome backdrop uh, to finish up this video. Thank you guys for watching. I'm super excited to get back down to uh, Athens soon and uh, shoot some videos again with Dr. Durr. Also, again, Dr. Armitage as well when I'm uh, back down there as well. So thanks for following along.